Hi, it's Michelle of Lab Muffin Beauty Science, Chemistry PhD, Cosmetic Chemist. Big fan of sunscreen, not such a fan of sunscreen myths. It's summer for almost everyone but Australians, so everyone is talking about sunscreens. I've debunked a lot of myths about sunscreen before, things like sunscreens are toxic, you can make your own sunscreen safely, but today I'm going to be focusing on incorrect advice from trusted media sources. Because you would expect them to be correct, and these myths are a bit harder to spot, and they have less obvious but still bad consequences. I'm going to go through a bunch of sunscreen news articles, explain what they got wrong, and what you should be doing instead. I don't entirely blame the people writing these articles because this is part of a larger problem with sunscreen misinformation from trusted sources, which we will see. Hopefully this will be an interesting excursion. Like and subscribe for more nerdy beauty content. We're going to start with this article from USA Today called What is Mineral Sunscreen and Why You May Want to Use It Instead of Chemical Sunscreen. I'm trying not to have a reaction just to this headline because a lot of sunscreen myths end up supporting this idea that mineral sunscreens are better and safer, which is mostly just confirmation bias for people's gut feelings that natural things should be safer and better. This isn't true, this is just a gut feeling that we've evolved because back in the day we would go into the wild and if we saw something weird, it was probably going to be dangerous. But these days we have much better ways of working out which things are dangerous versus safe. We don't have to rely on this gut feeling, which just doesn't really work in our modern world. But I guess technically this headline is fair because mineral sunscreen is a better option for some people, just not as many as the media and social media tends to make it out to be. For most people, chemical sunscreens are going to be a better option. And they actually do say the reasons why. So they say there is ease of application and aesthetic appeal. And these two things are really underrated. Mineral sunscreen gives a white cast on lots of people's skin, especially if you are darker skinned. It also tends to feel thicker and less comfortable, so that means a lot of people don't apply enough or they just skip applying it altogether, which is a much worse situation than using a chemical sunscreen. There are currently 14 FDA approved chemical filters in the US, but many more overseas. Chemical sunscreens have very small amounts of systemic absorption into one's bloodstream. So systemic means it goes into your body and goes everywhere, so it could potentially affect parts of your body, not just your skin. This finding has drawn lots of attention, however, at this time it is not known that this trace amount is problematic. This is a pretty good summary of those FDA studies that came out in 2019 and 2020. I would have preferred if she also mentioned where the current evidence is pointing. So for example, in the EU, this absorption has been known for quite a long time and so they've always assessed the safety of sunscreens based on that for like almost 20 years. I go into a lot more detail about the evidence in my US versus EU sunscreens video. Basically, the EU has been re-evaluating a lot of these older, more controversial chemical sunscreens, and there is still a really large margin of safety. She adds, additionally, if one has really sensitive skin, chemical sunscreens are more likely to cause a reaction. This is true on average for US sunscreens, but on an individual level, this is not necessarily true. In Europe, for example, mineral-only sunscreens aren't really a thing. All their sensitive skin sunscreens have lots of chemical filters because they tend to be better at blocking UV. They tend to use the newer chemical filters that don't get into the skin as easily to cause irritation, and so overall, you end up with more protection against both irritants as well as the sun. There's also this issue with SPF boosters, which are these chemical sunscreen-like ingredients that are not strictly regulated as chemical sunscreens, but they have very similar structures and very similar properties. These are listed as inactive ingredients rather than active ingredients, and so people aren't looking out for them and they end up reacting and they just don't know why. Newsom says mineral sunscreen could be referred to as physical sunscreen because it's a physical blocker. They're really, really good because they reflect the UV rather than the chemical sunscreen that absorbs the UV. This is the most common myth in all the sunscreen articles I've read. It is like the origin of a whole bunch of myths for why mineral sunscreens are better. I made this family tree a while ago showing how this has birthed so many myths. So it's been known for a really long time, more than 50 years, that mineral sunscreens also mostly absorb UV. Only about 5 to 10% is reflected. This is because these mineral sunscreens have a semiconductor structure. I've talked about it before in my video on how sunscreens work. One of the big reasons this myth is still around is because the American Academy of Dermatology website still has this. There's an article in 2016 that re-demonstrated that this is true for sunscreens specifically, but 
Yeah, it's just still around. This is one of those issues where you would think you would be able to trust a source, but this is not their specialty. My best advice for working out what is and isn't true is to look for the consensus of relevant experts. For how sunscreens interact with UV, this is chemistry or physics, it isn't dermatology. And so those are the more relevant experts and the consensus is overwhelmingly that they work by absorption. So there isn't much of a difference. They're not going to be really, really good because they reflect this extra 5%. It isn't really reflected. This 5 to 10% is actually scattered and most of that UV gets scattered towards the skin, deeper into that sunscreen layer. Most of the time it'll hit another molecule and get absorbed, which is what we want. Absorption is better because it actually takes the UV and turns it into something else, usually mostly heat. The scattering just kind of bounces the UV somewhere else and lets someone else deal with it. Newsom says mineral sunscreen is a little bit more effective than chemical sunscreen, they have a little bit broader spectrum of coverage. If you look at zinc oxide, it does look like it has a pretty flat spectrum. It covers a lot of wavelengths on its own. But if you take chemical sunscreens and put them together, they cover the same wavelengths and usually they can get much higher protection. So it doesn't really matter that zinc oxide on its own can cover everything because when you buy a sunscreen, you're not buying individual chemical filters. This is a problem that is solved by the people formulating the sunscreen. We don't have to worry about this. We just buy the one sunscreen. So we're looking for a high SPF rating and the words broad spectrum or a high PPD or PA rating. That's what these are there for. These directly measure what sort of protection you're getting from the product. The article mentions the issues with the application and aesthetics. People are less likely to apply the appropriate amount due to the thicker opaque nature of these formulations. Completely true. This is a huge problem. However, in recent years, mineral sunscreens have come a long way and there are now numerous products with with a lightweight field that apply with ease. This is true, but a lot of the time they are still relying on those SPF boosters, which are really just chemical sunscreens. So really they are hybrid sunscreens pretending to be mineral sunscreens, which is kind of just false advertising that I'm not really comfortable with. Next, they mentioned that there are tinted mineral sunscreens, which just basically takes the white cast out of it, which isn't entirely true that white cast is still often there. And sometimes the tint is also not quite the right color for your face. So it's kind of like, I guess two bad things that still end up making one bad thing. But I think looking for a tint of mineral sunscreen is still pretty good advice. This next bit though, chemical sunscreens have also been implicated in harming marine life in the ocean. Newsom says you can avoid this by using mineral sunscreens as they are very safe. There is this really common myth that chemical sunscreens and nano mineral sunscreens are bad for marine life, but non nano mineral sunscreen is completely safe. This is based on this 2016 study by Craig Downs and co-workers. The scientists who did this study promoted it really aggressively in the media on the day of release, which is pretty unusual. I've explained this a bit more in my video on reef safe sunscreens, as well as in my environmental myths video. Last year, the National Academies did a review of all of the evidence and their conclusion is mineral and chemical sunscreens overlap in regard to environmental impact. But overall, it doesn't seem like sunscreen has much of an impact at all because they are massively diluted. The amounts in the ocean are so tiny and the effect they can have is really, really small compared to things like global warming and agricultural runoff and land use and overfishing. That down study was a massive outlier. There were lots of issues with how they conducted their experiments. This article links to an NOAA page called Skincare Chemicals and Coral Reefs, which is another example of a source you thought you could trust. This page has kind of been haunting me for a few years because people would always bring it up in arguments to say, the NOAA obviously knows more about coral than you do. So it's worth mentioning that in the National Academies report, which was written by a lot of coral experts who actually did the original studies, specifically references this page alongside the EWG and a bunch of other questionable pages as examples of misinformation. The page says NOA is reviewing the National Academy study and upon completion of this review, they will update the information presented in this article as warranted. That was done in August 2022. Clearly, there are still media articles relying on it, so it would be nice if they updated it. On to our next article. This is from NPR and it's called Picking the Right Sunscreen Isn't as Important as Avoiding These Six Mistakes. So I quite like the overall message of this headline because 
there aren't that many differences between sunscreens. I do think people tend to overfocus on things like mineral versus chemical, really overanalyzing their sunscreens. Really the best thing to do is to pick a sunscreen that you like and apply a lot of it. So they start by telling you to chuck out last year's sunscreen, which I think is pretty good advice. If your sunscreen's been in last year's pool bag, it's probably been sitting around in the heat and heat is bad for sunscreens. Sunscreens are emulsions. That means they are blends of water and oil-based ingredients, which are not happy together. They're held in place temporarily by emulsifiers, but eventually they want to separate. If you have heat, that gives them enough energy to start separating faster. Sometimes when you squirt out an old sunscreen, you'll see that it has separated and that means it's not going to apply on your skin the same way. So the advice is good, but the reason is not as good. They say the active compounds can degrade and lose their effectiveness. This is true, but most of the time it is the separation. And this does contribute to the idea that mineral sunscreens are more stable, which is not really true because those minerals are quite dense. They want to settle to the bottom, but they don't quite say that. So I'm gonna leave that as half a myth in my rather subjective scoring system. So the first mistake they list is Concerned about chemicals? Try a mineral alternative. I don't like the way they've worded this because they are just kind of accepting the premise that chemicals are something to be concerned about, even though of course mineral sunscreens contain chemicals, everything is chemicals, but also chemical sunscreens specifically are meant to be something to be concerned about. So they sum up the situation with the FDA and they say there's no evidence of harm, but then they end with still, if you're concerned, there are options to avoid these compounds. I do like that they're highlighting there are options if you are concerned, but they're kind of both sizing this. As a media outlet, I think their role is to get to the truth, show the scientific consensus, which is they are safe. And the FDA actually has a quiz on their site. One of the questions is actually a recent FDA study showed that some sunscreen ingredients are absorbed into the body and they give you four options for what you should do. The correct option is I should continue to use sunscreen as directed. Evidence of absorption doesn't mean these ingredients aren't safe. It just means more data is needed. At the time those studies were published, the FDA also said you didn't have to avoid particular ingredients. So as expected, they have the whole thing about physical sunscreens physically blocking UV light, which is not true. But then they add that zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are much safer than chemical sunscreens because they're so inert. Inert means that they don't react, but that's not why they're safer. They're safer because their particles are huge and can't get through the skin very far. This is actually how the newer chemical sunscreens are designed. Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are not inert. A lot of the time they get coated before they get put into a sunscreen to make like a physical barrier between those particles and the rest of the sunscreen because they mess up the formulation. And this inert concept is linked to the idea that chemical sunscreens have to react with skin to work. NPR has that in another sunscreen article that's linked from this article. This leads to other myths like chemical sunscreens take 20 minutes to work or they have to be applied to bare skin, both of which are not true. They work immediately. You can put some chemical sunscreen on a piece of paper, shine a UV light on it, and you can see that it is blocking the UV. They make some points about why mineral sunscreens are better, they're less likely to irritate, which I guess is fair, and there are newer ones which are more cosmetically elegant. Again, I think that's fair, but this one, Unlike chemical sunscreens, these mineral-based sunblocks can stay on the surface of skin and act as a shield or barrier to deflect sunlight. Chemical sunscreens also almost completely stay on the surface. They don't go past the top few layers of skin, which are dead, except in tiny quantities. Again, I think this comes from that word absorb as well as absorbing UV. People have confused that with absorbing into skin. And again, we have a link to that NOA page on sunscreens destroying coral reefs. Now here is another myth that I see a lot. A sunscreen with an SPF sun protection factor of 15 blocks about 93% of UV rays. When you bump that up to SPF 30, you're blocking about 97%. Higher than that, you're not getting a lot more sun protection. This is not a good way of looking at it for a few different reasons. You can look at what gets blocked versus what gets in. So you can say 93% versus 97%, or you can say 7% gets in versus 3% gets in. What gets in makes more sense because that is what impacts you. It only matters if it does and starts interacting with stuff inside your body. That means that SPF 15 is letting in about twice as many UV photons, which means you have double the chance of damage. The second part of this is that 97% only happens if you apply it perfectly, exactly two milligrams per square centimeter, and you apply it perfectly evenly over your entire skin, which is 
not going to happen. Most people don't apply enough, they apply less than half that amount, which means you get half of the protection. Plus, even us sunscreen nerds are not going to apply perfectly even to all of our skin. But when you're looking at what gets in, that still scales with protection. So SPF 30 will always let in half as much UV as SPF 15 if you apply the same amount. You will always get double the protection. So this leads into this other aspect, which is there's no point going above SPF 30, but this isn't true in practice because of all this stuff we've just talked about. There are studies where people applied SPF 100 or SPF 50 sunscreen. There were about half as many sunburns with SPF 100, not just 1% less. This is actually why SPF ratings are designed the way they are. You are not meant to overthink that number. There's a paper from some sunscreen scientists trying to get people to stop saying this 97% thing, but the AAD still has it on their website. I do agree with this bit, skimping on sunscreen is probably a bigger mistake than not going above SPF 30. But the amounts they recommend are not correct. The recommendations for sunscreen amounts are based on two milligrams per square centimeter, which is what you need to get that SPF on the label. For the average adult, it's pretty much agreed that it will be 35 mils for your entire body. There are a bunch of papers calculating how much you should be applying and then translating it to rough amounts that are easy to remember. That's where all this shot glass and teaspoon stuff comes from, there's even a paper where they suggest a beer cap. Now the problem with all of these guidelines is that they are rough and the more people talk about them on the internet the more it spreads, it gets rougher and rougher. On top of that there is this sort of like imperial versus metric issue. The size of a shot glass is not standard around the world. In Australia it is 30 mils, in the US it is 30 to 44 mils. In Romania it is 100 mils. So one ounce is closer to the right amount than 1.5 ounces. Now for the face, one of the original papers where they suggest this teaspoon thing, they actually calculated three mils which is a bit over half a teaspoon for the face and neck. This has been further approximated by different places like the Australian Cancer Council. They recommend one teaspoon for face and neck and ears. A lot of people have also measured how big their face is. A quarter teaspoon for just your face is actually a pretty generous estimate already. So one teaspoon is just too much. That is four times as much. And most people's faces don't even need that full quarter teaspoon. For my face, this teaspoon would be six and a half times too much. It just isn't really achievable. And I think when you give people such an unachievable goal, it's just really discouraging. You just end up thinking sunscreen isn't going to work unless it's dripping off your face and that's not worth it so you may as well just not bother. But they have some good advice here. They say spray sunscreens are risky which is true. They say SPF doesn't tell you about time and you still need to reapply sunscreen. They have the correct explanation for why you need to reapply because they wear off especially if you're swimming or sweating. They mention that you still can get sunburn on a cloudy day which is true and they say don't keep your sunscreen in a hot place. Very good advice. Layer Wearing sunscreen with hats, clothing and sunglasses, this is great advice. I have some videos on how to choose sun protective clothing and how much protection you get with hats. They also mentioned these UV stickers which tell you when it's time to reapply sunscreen which is the correct use of them. I've seen a lot of people on social media using them to test sunscreens which doesn't actually work. It's just meant to be a cute way of reminding you to reapply. Now this next part is a bit of an issue. I've seen this in a bunch of articles lately. It's this idea that people with black skin still need to use sunscreen to prevent skin cancer. There's a research dermatologist who's done a lot of work on this topic. His name is Ade Adamson. He gave a talk at the Sunscreen E-Summit I hosted with Jen of the EcoWell last year. He's analyzed lots of different types of data and they all show that there is no correlation between sun exposure and skin cancer in black skin. For example, there is no increase in skin cancer in black skin when you go towards the equator. Now it is it's true that black people do still get melanoma and not in sun exposed areas but it isn't because there's less melanin there. A lot of people mention Bob Marley and how he died of a melanoma under his toenail but that was an acral melanoma which is not associated with sun exposure even in white skin. Toenails are actually excellent sunscreen, they block all of UV and they only let in about 0.5 to 2.5% of UVA. There is a concern with people with black skin, they tend to have lower skin cancer survival rates because they tend to be detected later and this is because of systemic issues. Black people are less likely to go to the dermatologist and melanomas don't look the same on dark skin so a lot of doctors can't spot them because of lack of training. So the message that black people can still get skin cancer is helpful but then 
linking it to sun exposure, linking it to not wearing enough sunscreen is just not right. This is the wrong solution. It doesn't really help and it sort of misallocates your resources, whether that's attention or investment in public health. There are other reasons for black people to wear sunscreen. It prevents wrinkles, it prevents hyperpigmentation, which is how dark skin tends to age, and it prevents sunburn. But skin cancer is not a good reason to wear it. There was this Washington Post article recently where they had Dr. Adamson talking about his research and then a bunch of other dermatologists saying people with black skin still need to wear sunscreen and they presented both sides as equal but this is just not how science works it's not a popular vote again it's about the consensus of relevant experts and dr adamson is much more relevant than other dermatologists here he's done that research and scientific consensus isn't just like an opinion you need the scientists to look at and understand the same data and come to a conclusion that makes scientific sense the next article is from The Mirror. Doctor explains what SPF number on sunscreen really means and how often to reapply. So the first thing they talk about after all the fluff is what does SPF mean? And they say SPF refers to the amount of time you can stay out in the sun without burning. So with SPF 50, you can stay out in the sun 50 times longer without burning than you could have if you didn't have sunscreen on. This myth is really common and the reason it doesn't work is because the sun's intensity changes a lot. In SPF testing, time works because the lamp gives out a constant amount of UV. So the UV dose that you're getting, how much is getting into your skin, is directly proportional to how long that lamp has been on. But this doesn't work in the sun and it definitely doesn't work with higher SPF. In the middle of the day in summer, fair skin burns in about 10 minutes. And so SPF 50, 50 times longer, that's 500 minutes, which is more than eight hours. Your sunscreen is not going to stay on your skin in an even film for eight hours. You're going to have to reapply it because it'll start clumping up, it'll start sweating off. So a better definition is really just this. It's a measure of how well the sunscreen protects you from getting burnt. There is another myth here, which is that SPF is just to do with the effect of UVB. It isn't. There's also some contribution to burning from UVA. If you blocked out all the UVB and let in all the UVA, you would only get SPF of around 11. On its own, it's not the worst myth, but it is linked to another myth, which is mentioned here. UVA rays from the sun are the ones that cause the DNA damage. It's actually almost completely the other way around. UVB damages DNA directly, DNA will actually absorb UVB and kind of explode. DNA is actually transparent to UVA. UVA will interact with other things and form free radicals which then indirectly damage DNA. The reason I think this myth exists is because we knew about UVB being bad for ages, but we didn't discover UVA's damage for quite a long time. So there's this misconception that UVA is more dangerous when in reality it's just been previously underrated. Now there is one good thing about UVB and that is it helps with vitamin D production. So this myth has led to a lot of people asking, why don't we just have UVA sunscreens that let in all the UVB? Why don't we just look for the highest UVA protection? I don't care about SPF. But you should care about SPF because DNA damage. Again, there's this idea that how much sunscreen you apply is more important than SPF. I don't really agree. I think they are both important. If you have lower SPF, you'll need to apply more and vice versa. But that is really just a difference of opinion. This one is a common myth I've been seeing in the news. For chemical sunscreens, you need to reapply every two to three hours as it degrades in sunshine and becomes less effective. Mineral sunscreens only need to be reapplied after swimming, toweling off or rubbing it off. This is incorrect and actually quite dangerous. The reason you need to reapply sunscreen is not because the chemicals are decomposing, it's because the sunscreen film clumps up on your skin because you have this film sitting on your skin, you have sweat, you have transepidermal water loss, water is just evaporating out of your skin, you have oil coming out from below, your skin is moving around, that film does not want to stay as a nice, even, complete film. Once you have water and oil punching holes in the film from below, you're not going to have protection in that gap. If you look on the back of a mineral sunscreen, it will tell you to reapply every two hours, as well as during these times, after swimming, toweling, etc. Mineral sunscreens can in fact last less long on the skin because they are chunky. Chemical sunscreens can absorb into those top layers and that kind of keeps it in place. 
But mineral sunscreens just sit on top of your skin in those particles and they tend to move around and go into furrows. So definitely reapply your mineral sunscreen just like you would reapply a chemical sunscreen. This bit is correct. Even if it says the sunscreen is water resistant, you still need to reapply after swimming. That water resistant rating is based on people sitting still in a tub of water. You're probably going to be moving around a lot more in the water, which will make that sunscreen wear off faster. This next bit, moisturizer or foundation with SPF isn't sufficient. I agree with the foundation, but not with the moisturizer. The way a moisturizer with SPF and a sunscreen are formulated are the same. Whether the product gets called a sunscreen or a moisturizer is just based on marketing, not based on what it does. So as long as you apply the same amount, like quarter teaspoon to just your face, you will get the same protection. There are studies that compared how much of a sunscreen people applied and how much of an SPF moisturizer, and they found that the SPF moisturizer wasn't applied as much, but these are generally the SPF moisturizers that come in jars. They're really not representative of what's on the market. There are a lot of SPF rated moisturizers which could have very well just had the word sunscreen on them. In Australia, there's a bunch of formulas that are really similar. They have the same percentages of the active ingredients and sometimes they're called SPF moisturizers, sometimes they're called sunscreens. So I would judge just based on texture and not on what word they used on the packaging. This is also probably not the best order, putting sunscreen and then moisturizer. There are a couple of studies that found that if you put the moisturizer on after sunscreen, then it kind of works like a cleansing oil. The film just gets messed up because when you apply a moisturizer, you rub it. In general, if you've put on the sunscreen layer, you just want to disturb it as little as possible. So putting the moisturizer on underneath is a better idea. Even better would be if you just use a moisturizing sunscreen or an SPF moisturizer. Just have both of them in the one product. Our next article is from Vox. It's called Seven Burning Questions About Sunscreens Answered. The subtitle is yes, you need to wear it. And the start of the article talks about things like how sunscreen is non-negotiable regardless of the weather or your skin type. Any dermatologist will say so. One thing that's interesting is that this seems to be only the consensus for US dermatologists. Even in Australia with our level of sun, our official guidelines say you only need to wear sunscreen if the UV index is three or above. Now, if you're into skincare, I think you should wear it every day because so many skin concerns are made worse by UV. But from a skin cancer perspective, I really don't think this is supported by the evidence. And again, we have this myth. Regular sunscreen use can lower your risk of skin cancers, both among lighter skinned people who are more susceptible to skin cancer and people of color who are more likely to die from skin cancer due to a delay in detection. Again, that last bit about delay in detection is correct. But there is no evidence that regular sunscreen use will lower the risk of skin cancer in people with dark skin. And this also extends a bit to other people of color too. The link between sun exposure and skin cancer is just a lot weaker than for white people. Now let's go on to these actual burning questions. Again, we see this misconception. UVA rays penetrate the skin more deeply. That part is true, but greater contributor to skin cancer is not. It is really well established that UVB is the greater contributor. This is kind of like suggesting a myth, but they don't really quite say it. UVA rays are aging rays. There's this common idea that UVA, A stands for aging, B stands for burning, but that's not true. Both of them contribute to both. I already talked about how short wavelength UVA contributes to burning. UVB also contributes to aging. UVB actually directly contributes to age spots by messing up the DNA of melanocytes, those cells that produce melanin at the bottom of their epidermis. But picking a sunscreen that protects against both UVA and B is good advice. Now, this is a good point. Mineral sunscreens aren't natural. They get processed massively before they go into a product because you need to get rid of things like contaminants. But they do have this myth. Mineral sunscreens work by creating a barrier on the skin that reflects UV rays. And they mention this related myth. Chemical sunscreens get absorbed into the skin and help create chemical reactions that lead to repelling the UV rays. There's no chemical reaction involved in absorbing UV. If the chemical sunscreen undergoes a reaction, that is a bad thing. It means it's not photostable. It's going to break down. What happens is the electrons absorb the UV and they get more energetic, but the bonds don't actually change. Again, if you want more info on that, check out my video on how sunscreens work. There's pros and cons to each type. That is true. Regardless of what type of sunscreen you prefer, make sure it's water and sweat resistant. I think water and sweat resistance is good, but it's not really necessary, I think, for an everyday sunscreen that you're wearing to the office. Water resistant sunscreens still tend to be pretty uncomfortable because they form a really strong film that doesn't move as much. There's no standard for sweat resistance anywhere, so a lot of the time you won't see this on sunscreens, and even if you do, it's hard to tell what it means, like how they tested it. 
unless the company literally tells you exactly what they did. Next, they go through some of the pros and cons of chemical versus mineral sunscreens, and these are pretty good ones. It is mostly about what you prefer. I like that they mention fragrance in the middle of this because that is an ingredient that some people react to, but it's kind of weird how they kind of say it is only a concern for chemical sunscreens. Later on, they do mention looking for a fragrance-free mineral sunscreen though, so maybe that was just awkward wording. They have this bit on how much should I spend on sunscreen and yeah, you don't have to buy anything expensive or fancy. This bit with tints not materially changing the efficacy of the sunscreen, I half agree with this. If you're just talking about SPF, then that's true. The SPF is what it says on the package. But that tint comes from iron oxide, which does help with darker skin if you have pigmentation problems. Iron oxide can absorb blue light, which can lead to longer lasting pigment changes. How much SPF do I need? They have the SPF definition with time. So again, that's not quite correct because the sun changes. And again, they have this thing with how going above SPF 30 is not going to give you much additional protection, which is not true. They say apply sunscreen 30 minutes before going outside. That's probably overkill. Usually the recommendation is 15 to 20 minutes. And that's just to let it dry down, form a complete film, not rub off. And also to make sure you don't go into the sun and get a whole bunch of sun exposure before you get the sunscreen on. The best sunscreen option is one that you'll readily use. That is correct. Having a spray is better than nothing. But this bit, reapply every two to four hours if you're in the sun, that is not enough. Pretty much every recommendation if you're spending time outdoors is reapply every two hours or perhaps even more frequently. I have seen this myth a few times on Australian websites and it is to do with the four hour water resistance rating, but this is not an Australian article. And Australian four hour water resistant sunscreens will still say to reapply every two hours because of that film wearing off. Honestly, I think they should change that water resistance rating to a different name for four hours. It's kind of misleading. Wear sunscreen on your face and neck every day as UV rays can penetrate windows in your home and car. I don't think this is really necessary. It depends on what your home is like. I have a video on working out whether or not you need to wear indoor sunscreen. In the car, I think you do because you have so much window space, but in your home, if you're not sitting directly in the sun, if you're quite far away from the window, you probably don't need sunscreen. Now this bit, French and Korean sunscreens versus American ones. There is this idea I see a lot online still, which is Korean sunscreens are less reliable than ones from the US, and I completely disagree. The article says a few years ago, there were some Korean sunscreens that a company had tested by an independent laboratory and it did not perform up to the label claim of the SPF. This issue is really not limited to Korea. I've talked about it before in another video. There are lots of consumer magazines that do independent SPF testing on sunscreens they've purchased and published the results. Consumer reports, which choice consumer NZ, and every year there are a bunch that fail. Part of this is because SPF testing is a biological test and there is usually more variation with that. So there's always been lots of variation between different SPF testing labs. It depends on the country, what sorts of people are coming in and getting their skin tested, who's looking at when the skin goes pink, but some of them do fall short by quite a lot. And it does feel weird to single out Korea when the biggest cause of these fails is probably the US. The biggest sunscreen testing scandal that's ever happened was with AMA Laboratories in the US. It's on the FDA website. This lab was essentially committing fraud for 30 years, from 1987 until 2017. For SPF testing, you need to have a certain number of people you're testing on, and they just pretended they had more people. They just like made up numbers. So this means they could really speed up testing and they could also charge a lot less. So lots and lots of brands use them. There's now even a special note in the Australian regulations where it says, if you got your sunscreens tested by this lab, you need to have new tests done by some date. With the Korean sunscreens, Adil Minod has a video on that. The issue seems to be they changed from a tinted sunscreen to untinted without retesting it. And this is allowed in a lot of places around the world. In Korea, this loophole seems to be fixed now. And this is one really good thing about Korean regulators. They are very quick to deal with problems. So I don't think this problem is really relevant to Korean sunscreens anymore, but Sunscreens do fail testing all the time, including from the brands mentioned here. And here are my rankings. The longer the article, the more myths. So I also calculated it as words per myth, like a measurement of myth sparseness. And the longer articles ended up doing better, maybe because they were more padded out. I also counted which myths came up the most. No surprise, our grandpa myth topped it. I made this sunscreen myth bingo card a while back. The stuff on the right is mostly crunchy social media myths, so I didn't really expect to do that well there, but the ones on the left are the ones I've seen from more trusted sources. Decent hit rate. I did not expect these two myths to come up as much as they did. 
So overall, the myths in these articles aren't that bad, but it is really frustrating to see these come up again year after year and still not get corrected. It'll be really nice to see a better hit rate over the years. Maybe I'll just repeat this exercise every year. I did have a couple of other articles from Bloomberg and Reader's Digest, which had really fear-mongering myths about the toxic effects of sunscreen, which I couldn't really fit into this video because I would have to go into a lot more detail. I'll probably talk about those soon, but yeah, I hope you found this interesting. In the meantime, the most important things for finding a sunscreen, look for a sunscreen that's protective enough for whatever activity you're doing. These are the three labels you're looking for. If you're doing something really sweaty, then go for the maxima for all of these. Second thing you're looking for is a sunscreen that you enjoy enough to wear every day. This includes things like texture, whether it irritates your skin, even whether or not it fits in your budget. If you have a sunscreen that's really expensive that you skimp on, that is not good value. If you have a sunscreen that was really cheap that you don't enjoy and you never use, that is also not good value. See you next time. There is a 50-50 chance it'll be about sunscreen.